recording it. Um, so today we're doing Mirage, uh, key utility, and then afterwards we're discussing like um, general understanding of the map. Because uh, even though Mirage is the easiest map in the map pool for most, since it's played so much, um, I think a lot of people fail to realize why uh, the map is easy, or at least, yeah, I don't want to give too much away here in the introduction, but basically, I will hopefully give you an understanding of the map that uh, allows you to understand when to take timings uh, and when not to take timings, and just in general, um, why the map gets played like it does. Because the way I see it, a map like Overpass, for example, is a map where you typically have to have a pretty strong default or you're gonna take a lot of risk. Uh, a map like Inferno, like we that we talked about in my session last week, is a map where it's very utility based, and that's why we talked a lot about utility, how to take banana and all these kind of things. A map like Mirage, it's so much about moving parts. Um, I remember back in like 2014, 2015, before I was anything near a pro player, we played against a Bulgarian team called like G Play, uh, with a lot of very famous Bulgarian players. Um, and this was the first time I played Mirage where we got absolutely demolished and after the match we sat back and we said wow these guys are so good at working the map all at the same time and um, the map has changed a little bit they added the bench but other than that the map is played somewhat in the same uh, way and a lot of maps in counter-strike you can go for like a for like a pop or something like this uh, a map like inferno it's a map where you group up a lot but mirage is really a map where having a strong t side default is uh super important and um, we'll get more into that i will just go ahead and start with the utility um so let me lower the volume slightly and um the most basic piece of utility i imagine a lot of you will know these at the beginning we have a stealth smoke line up here aim here in between like this and this and you throw it's pretty simple it goes over and it lands stairs then for the uh, bench smoke i get i count one two three i go in the middle of this one then i aim from the dark spot and i aim up here half height of this and i let go and in sees go this sometimes left a little bit of a gap but in sees two the smokes are so big that they actually fill up completely and then the last smoke, there are many different ways to throw this. The one that I like the most I is... nothing with your, your mic isn't right. Like... Oh, I thought it was just my internet. Okay. Yeah, 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 I thought mm. the first time, but... Uh... Yeah, a little lagging a bit. Okay, so for the CT smoke, um, I like to get stuck in here. So if you just hold shift and you walk, you get like stuck in this corner. There's like a st corner. And then I look up, I find the one that is square. And then I go from the left side and down to this line. And then I do a normal jump throw. And this one goes over and it should block CT completely. It lands right here and it should block so that ticket is smoked. Only if you go up here, of course. And then there are no gaps. Um, these are the very common uh, smokes on Mirage. But I guess taking it a level uh, further is uh, being able to smoke stuff when you are Tetris. Because what happens on a lot of Mirage rounds is you push up A and you get blocked in this area, they flash and you are too afraid to move, or maybe you kill the A player and now you want to swing, but you're unable to swing because there's no utility. Um, I will show you kind of, kind of quick some of the important utility to know. So if you get stuck in this corner, you can aim there's this white line and there's this. If you aim in between and in between the green and this wall, it's like, imagine there's a square here, basically. If you aim in the middle of this square, this one goes over and it lands deep jungle. Then I actually think they just changed this corner because I couldn't get stuck in it. There used to be a corner you could get stuck in here. I don't know why you can't anymore. Um, I guess maybe now you can line up like this. And you can aim from this and up, just so it doesn't hit the wall. I'm not sure if this will land actually, because they kind of changed the map. Yeah, it won't. Um, that's interesting. So they they changed this a little bit, uh, maybe on this line and up, something like this. We'll see if it works. Yeah, so that works for top connector. 
Um, worth knowing when you throw a top connector smoke is that if you smoke like this, it will give the CT a lot of space to play around the smoke. Whereas if I would smoke like here in CS2, this is still a top con smoke, at least when it fully blooms. Okay, I didn't land it perfectly, but let's say we throw it like this. This is still a top con smoke where the CTs won't really be able to see any of the T's crossing. But now stairs is so open and and kind of naked. So if you swing here now, there is no smoke for the CT to play in. And it's much easier to kill them. Um, so it's just worth knowing for you um, that there is kind of different ways to throw a con smoke. I'll get into this real quick. Um, I think smoking con like this is super strong in the event that you have a lurk from underground or from top mid who is walking through the con smoke because it gives them a lot more space to walk through microphone and then doing it again. is the microphone doing it again you know what um yeah, I just did it quickly at least but yeah that's good if it works for you guys then it works for me um talking about these top con smokes i'll try to say it again um if you smoke here and you have a lurk this can be used really well because when he's walking up here he will have a lot of smoke to play around in and then he can peek jungle or he can peek CT and kind of play around this cover. Um, if you don't have someone lurking up, that's when I prefer to use a smoke that dance a little bit more on the left side. So that for the CT he has no space to play here. But yeah, that's just that's kind of just a small side thing I guess. That uh, you can use these top con smokes like the rule I had in CSGO at least was that we use the one that lands in the middle if we have a lurk, and if we don't have a lurk, we use one that lands more here. Um, yeah, it's it's worth for you to, to think about, I guess, um, but it's not super important. Another way to throw the top con smoke is just going in here, and there's this white spot. You want to aim as much right as possible, but without hitting the walls. So obviously, if I'm doing this... Uh, okay, that actually was really unlucky, I guess. But if you aim more sort of here in the middle, take one step, it should hit there. And the difference with this smoke is that it lands more uh, either like here on the wall. And if you aim a little bit more to the right, you can try that. Uh, it will land actually kind of inside connector. Um, so this is kind of the deepest con smoke you can throw from, from Tetris. Other than this, you can go here. You can aim on this square. And you can jump through, and this is a way to uh, molo ticket. And also, just this one everyone knows. Um, it's a little bit tricky, but you can actually, if you are sick, uh, it's, I'm not sick right now. You can molo the top of bulk like this sometimes, but it's probably not worth. Um, if you want to molo of default, this is something I see people do wrong a lot. A lot of people will either models off like this, or they will models off like this. And I kind of think that they both suck, because the normal reaction, if you're playing against good players, is if you models off default, this guy who gets models off, he will go out, and now he's sitting here. And he's only holding the jump up if you jump up Tetris. And because you are jumping up uh, when you peek him, he has an advantage in this fight. So what I like to do is I try to just bounce the mullo on the back wall. So it lands like this. And now as you can see, it still burns out his position. But he also has no space to fall back. Or he has to stand all the way here. Which is just not that great. Because now you can kind of swing him from both sides. Like you can peek him from here and you can peek him from here. Whereas if he's sitting like this, he has cover from the right side basically. Uh, other than this, yeah, it's maybe a little bit, uh, I would call it niche, but I have had some uses with it before. If you want to do a fast, deep jungle smoke, you can crouch here. You can aim up from this to the height of the satellite dish. Do a normal throw, and this one goes over and blocks deep jungle fast. So if you want to um, set up your teammates... It's possible for you to just do this and just do like a, a back uh, crouch flash for stars. If your teammates uh, also have 
A top con smoke, for example, there's a super easy way to, to take this space. Um, I do also believe there is a lineup. I haven't used it for a while, so I'm probably getting it wrong. But there is some lineup here where you can uh, line up on the wall, do a like jump throw that goes over and lands deep jungle. And then uh, if you aim a little bit down from this, I believe you can get a flash that, that bounces on the top of the stairs like this. Um, this is also a super good combo to learn. There is most definitely some spot here that you have to aim on, but uh, I fail to remember exactly which one. But I suggest you, uh, like, I guess it's around this black dot. You can check it out real quick, so it's in the video. So around here. Uh, let me test it one more time. Yeah. And if you then aim just a little bit down, that is mostly done on feeling, then the flash will bounce on the stairs. If you flash the flash the same way as you flash the... Or like uh, throw the smoke. Let me show you real quick. Then the flash will land like this. Which is not bad, but it is a little bit uh, high up, I guess. And if you do the one where you aim a little bit further down, when it bounces on the stairs, uh, this one was pretty bad. But at least you can you can get one that, that bounces on the stairs. Uh, I haven't really used these nades that much in CS2, but they are worth to know that they exist, so you can you can find your own lineup real quick. Um, other than this, there's top mid smoke. Uh, probably all of you know this as well. You just get uh, you wedge yourself into this corner. I aim right side of this, and this is just regular top mid smoke. It gets used a lot uh, in my face it matches and also sometimes in pro play. There is a very easy counter to this smoke that I will be showing you on the CT side. And uh, I also throw my top mid smoke if I'm uh, wanting to throw it from the right side. I stand on top of the trash can, I crouch and I aim around here. This should land roughly the same spot. And the last one is just if you want to do a window smoke in CSGO you have to aim here and hold D and jump throw. This one does not work anymore for the people who haven't tested it themselves. So what you do now is actually somewhat easier. You just hold D but you aim up in the in the red space here and then jump throw. And this should work. Um, on B as well, there are a few key pieces of utility that I think are important. Some of them are flashes and some of them are smokes. Uh, one really key piece, uh, like key piece of utility is uh, this one. I just go pretty close to the left wall. I don't have a specific lineup. I do it on feeling and I aim pretty high up. And as I'm running, I throw this flash that jumps out of the window. The reason why this flash is so strong is because it takes this angle and it also takes the angle over a bench. So it kind of breaks up this crossfire in a really solid way. Um, besides that, it doesn't take that much, but it's a great flash to uh, to kind of go with. And then you always want to pair it up with someone throwing deep flashes. I like to throw my flash as deep as I, as I can um, without failing it. So if you throw it like this, you can... Uh, Either throw it kind of like I did here, where it lands over apartments. This could be good, because if the CTs are playing backside and holding balcony, they will get blinded by this flash. Almost no matter where they stand. We can uh, test it out real quick. Ah, this was a little bit unlucky. Um, but it actually sets up kind of what I was wanting to say, and that is... Um, I like to throw my flashes as far as I can for the first flash and sort of on this line for the same reasons as I said before about the window flash if you throw the flash up here this flash is going to kind of break up this crossfire a little bit um, I don't think it takes this angle but it again will take a lot of these angles if you uh, land the flash correctly and what I then like to do is doing my second flash 
Um, so I do the first flash here, and then I will do the second flash over apartments. The reason being that there are a few angles that will not get taken by the, the first flash. Um, there could be some specific situations where, uh, like we saw, that it gets obstructed by uh, this uh, pillar, or maybe if they're standing like this, holding this, um, like this apartment's flash won't take him, but if he's holding like this, maybe it will. Um, I just like to change it up. And getting the second flash over apartments means um, if they have a guy who's playing like a weird off angle, he will be uh, taken by the second flash either way. There's one more flash on B I want to show you. And uh, it is a little bit interesting. Um, I think it actually has a lot of use, but you never really see pros use it because it is, um, yeah, I guess not that well known. But I think we've all been playing a match where we um, are in a situation where the CTs have an AWP posted on this angle. And the problem with a CT playing balcony with AWP is that he is almost impossible to flash. If the CT is playing back on car, that's when these flashes come in handy. Even the flashes out the window that we discussed will take him. But flashing the AWP who's playing up on top of the balcony is really difficult. And that's why knowing this self-pop flash is very nice. There is this uh, kind of wooden pillar out here. And if you take a sneak step as you throw your flash, this flash comes back and bounces here. And it should take any orb uh, who's holding this angle. And the reason I like this flash so much is because for the AWP player, it just looks like a failed flash. Like the flash literally disappears out of the map and comes back in. If you land it with enough speed as well, it should take uh, the people playing from this side. I don't think I did in this moment. But you can uh, do it even with a little bit more power and a little bit higher. And then it should like uh, bounce far enough that it takes this orb as well. And to my knowledge, it is somewhat the only flash that takes these angles. I know there is a flash you can throw where you are um, lining up somewhere back here. I personally have not learned this flash. Um, but there is a lineup where you can run and you can uh, do a flash that bounces in for the orb. This one is also quite good, but I think for people who uh, like to play a lot of pugs as well, I actually uh, prefer this self-pop flash since you're able to do it and push off the orb uh, without anyone else's help. The last uh, piece of utility that I want to show you guys is just uh, the one on B. I believe in CSGO you aimed up here, but I've actually been failing it. And in case you didn't know, or maybe it does work this time, it is kind of pixel perfect. And uh, I have tried experimenting with throwing the smoke a little bit lower. But uh, I guess it worked in, in this case. Um, the reason why you want to throw this smoke is just because when the AWP comes rotating in from window and he wants to help on B, this is one of the first angles he will take if there's no smoke here. And if there is a smoke here, uh, he can take this angle. So he's forced to just sit and hold the left side here. And... Um, yeah, that's probably for another time, since we won't have time for it today. But the normal entry pathing for a T going out B will be jumping out the window and running this way. And this smoke will allow your team to take a whole lot more space. So this was kind of the the key uh, T Uto. Um, I want to talk about one small thing real quick that I think will help you guys massively on your CT sides. And afterwards, we will kind of uh, move into, I guess, today's main course. I think a lot of you will probably know many of these grenades already. And for you, uh, there might be like uh, one or two pieces of utility you haven't seen that you've maybe learned now. Um, but the last part of the session is is kind of the, the point of the session, I would say. Because this is where we get into the, the general understanding of the map which will help people who are anywhere from, yeah, basically uh, the starting ELO and face it and all the way up to, uh, yeah, the highest levels. Um, 
I want to show you a couple of more things before we get to it though. Um, there are two more pieces of utility on the T side that I actually just remember what I have. Uh, one of them is this one. I uh, use this as like an A rush in my CS2 games and I find it works pretty well. If you get stuck here and you crouch and you aim right here and you uh, crouch forward one step and you jump throw. As long as I don't fail it, this should be a deep jungle smoke. And even though it does look a little scuffed, it does fill out completely. And then this one does sometimes fail, but let's hope it doesn't now. I, from the same position, ask for another smoke. And I will crouch and I will aim in like this square. And I will also crouch just a little bit forward. This is a top connector smoke. It can be a little bit random at times. But it does land most of the time. And with these two smokes, you basically block off the entire left side. You don't leave this corner open for anyone to boost or play around in. And what we discussed earlier with the Top Gun smoke, the stairs area is super naked. So if you just get a single flash on stairs, you dodge it and you peek, there is no hiding spot for the CT in this smoke. Um, so this is uh, another two key pieces of utility in my opinion they can be really good to use uh, on an a rush rush which is uh, in my opinion very strong on uh, mirage so i want to show you two more things um i mentioned that for the top mid smoke that t's do a lot there is a sort of easy counter and um i guess this is something that was popular popularized uh a little bit later in the meta. I guess it's only really in the last two years we've seen it a lot. But if someone does the top mid smoke against me and they only do the top mid smoke, almost always what I will do is I will just Molotov behind boxes. It sounds very simple and it also is, but the reason why this is so good is because the T's are not able to cross here. It allows my connector player to go and peak connector and since I'm not smoked window, I can see if they're crossing uh, right side of boxes. So as long as this Molotov is up when my connector player peaks, we basically have full mid control. At this moment, the connector player can hold this and I could uh, potentially just be like uh, holding as well for a swing. If I'm feeling a little bit risky, I could hold this or I could also ask my connector player to go peak underground while I hold right side boxes. The point is at least with this kind of information, you know the T's cannot take mid. And that's why this uh, Molotov is really strong. I want to show you guys a lineup for this through the uh, window smoke as well. If you jump up here, and you put your crosshair like this. You can just walk out into the middle. And even if you're smoked, you can run forward. And this should be good for the boxes. Um, I can show it with a smoke here. Just for anyone who is interested. So if you jump up here. You can do this lineup, go to the middle, run and throw. And this, even if you are smoked window, will make it so that your connector player only has to focus on this area. He doesn't have to worry about right side and he knows if he has this area, the T's don't have mid control. Many of you have probably seen this as well, but it's kind of the last thing I want to show you before we move into like the general understanding of the map. If you're standing here and you aim here with an HE and you jump throw, this blows up the window smoke and you can peek everything. If this lineup on the ground is not visible, because sometimes it isn't, you can either like kind of wing it, which does sometimes uh, mess you up. And if you don't want to wing it, then I have a solution for you. If you get stuck in the same corner and you aim up on this brown mark, I believe it should kind of give the same effect. The reason why I personally prefer doing the grenade like this is because there is less of a sound cue. Um, there's only the the grenade throwing sound, whereas if you do this lineup, the grenade bounces like a million times. Okay, that was a lot of utility and a little bit of talk about uh, how to use your utility to win mid SCT. Are there any questions before we move into like the, the next segment? Okay, perfect. Then I'll move on. So, um, 
the real reason why we are doing this session today is because I want to talk about the general understanding of Mirage as a map. Now, uh, I brought it up, I think, at the beginning of the session that there are maps like Opass, for example, where um, they are very team play heavy maps. You need to be good at flashing for each other. You need the right amount of playing slow. You need the right amount of taking areas uh, without utility. So essentially like risking your life to take space. And um, on top of that, there are maps like Inferno, which are very utility based. There are maps like Nuke, which is like almost all down to CT rotations and, and how the T side decides to use their smokes to put pressure. Um, and there are maps like Mirage, which are way more simple. Um, and even though they're simple and a lot of people understand how to play them or understand like which plays they like to do, um, I have kind of uh, theorized that the map can be isolated somewhat to just thinking about mid and just thinking about A. Um, what I'm saying is that a standard CC setup looks like this. You have an A player who every round will come here and do a Molotov to block. And then he will either play retake or he will play inside the site. It could be default, it could be shadow, it could be Belk, it could be sandwich, it could be uh, ninja, it could be anywhere really. So he has those two options, play retake or play inside site. <laughs> Then you have your con player, and your con player has two options. He has play con or stack A. This is obviously very simplified, but I think we can all agree that the con player is most likely to do this instead of, let's say, stacking B randomly in any given round. You have your window player, and the window player will, nine times out of ten, I would say, start window. If he gets blocked, especially now in CS2, he will probably do this grenade that I just showed to check mid info. Or he will Molotov behind the box so if there's top mid smoke. Maybe he will even do both. But one thing that's for sure is that if this guy gets smoked behind, like uh, gets stuck behind the window smoke, he will rotate. Because there is no impact for an orb standing and looking at this smoke. Now, there are a different, uh, like a few different ways that AWP can rotate, but. I would say the two most common ones are rotating jungle and holding palace or rotating CT and holding slope. There is uh, a third option, which is rotating B to hold here. And there's a sort of fourth option, which is rotating con and playing inside con with orb. Um, playing inside con with orb is also very strong, but it is seen a lot less and I suspect we will see it even uh, less in CS2, simply because there's now the possibility of smoking a uh, con off like this, which would kind of eliminate the point of having an AWP in Connect. Back. The last two players are going to be a short player who will either play uh, helping B or he will play acro short. If he's playing helping B, it will be something like playing Edward, holding Molotov in case they rush. And if he's playing aggro short, it will likely be something like doing a smoke like this, doing a smoke like this, uh, running out, throwing a flash or window, fighting. Uh, there's many different ways you can play aggro short, but this is what a lot of short players will do. And then you have the B player who is, uh, I guess he has two options, which is like play to block, or he can play aggro B. Aggro B being pushing B house and trying to take the kitchen which happens very rarely. Well, what I am hoping that I can get you guys to understand after this session is that if you as a T put a top mid smoke, well, we have just discussed a pretty strong counter to this, Molotoving behind boxes and having the con player peak. Boom. Okay, the T's are either in the smoke or they're not out mid. If you, as a T, do the window smoke that I showed before and you smoke window. Okay, I failed it now, but the lineup definitely works. I threw it a little bit too quick. But if there's, if we imagine there is a window smoke and the AWP does this grenade, he can check mid. Okay, mid is clear. And 
by doing either of these smokes, you essentially haven't changed anything unless you make the CTs give up the space. Now, I just said if the CT gets smoked in window, like if the CT off gets smoked in window, his normal reaction is to rotate somewhere. Now, if uh, if we imagine a scenario where we don't smoke the window up, what do you think the AWP will do? Like, imagine you don't smoke top mid and you don't smoke window. Does anyone, like, can anyone tell me what he'll, the orb will probably do? He'll ask for a flash to peak mid. Yeah, and then? Then I think personally he will. Yeah, yeah. No he would. He would hold mid, right? Yeah. If I as an orb peak mid start of round and there's no top mid smoke and no window smoke, I will sit here for a couple of seconds holding mid, because if someone swings, it's a free kill, right? That's at least how I how I see it. So, doing this top mid smoke or doing the window smoke, it is kind of to nullify the orb, and if there's no smoke, well, the setup for the CTs looks like this. You have a con player, like, uh, I will go over the positions. You have an A player who's either playing VTech or side. So you have at least one A. Well, if the AWP is not smoked, he can call mid clear. And then what do the con player do? Well, the con player, he will try to help A because if the T's are not out mid, now he needs to worry about his bomb side, right? So that means we have at least two A. So the setup right now, because the B players probably won't change anything with this, is, uh, oh well, the B players will also change if the if the short player is going out aggro short, and the orb calls mid is full clear, the short player, he's going to go back and he's going to try to help his bomb side, and he may even use a Molotov. Basically, if you don't do mid pressure as T, the CTs are going to be playing heavy on the sides, right? Now, the setup in this moment is like this, 2-1-2, two, 2-A, one, two. Two one mid, and 2-B. Imagine the scenario where the T side is actually doing a good job, and they, let's say, smoke window from spawn, they make it across to boxes before the orb does the nade, they now have mid control. Well, let's discuss how is the setup going to look. Well, as I, as I mentioned, the orb is going to rotate, and I think a very likely rotation for him is going to be going jungle and holding palace. If the orb is holding palace like this, it means that the CT on A, who is either jumping in for or is playing committed side, he now is only needed to like he only needs to watch ramp. Well, if one guy is holding ramp and the other guy is holding A house, that means they are playing two on A. But if that is the case, that means we need someone who is sort of having info on mid. And that someone is going to be the con player who, at least in CSGO, would 9 times out of 10 do this smoke to play around with. So he can block short by playing around the smoke. He can block con, and now the only worry is window boost, which, you know, is probably not something the T's are going to do every single round. This means that right now we have 2A, 1 mid, and then we have either an aggro short player or a guy helping B. So basically the setup is two on two. The only thing you have done with this window smoke is that you have made it so you can walk forward mid more easily. You are now with a window smoke here able to walk down in the mid lane. Holy shit. Okay, I, I line up on this antenna and I run as much as I can and then it will never fail. Just a lineup if you guys don't have one. But this window smoke allows me to now walk down in the mid lane and probably play behind the current smoke that the CT has thrown. Um, this means the only thing that I have managed with this window smoke is the access to walk down mid, basically. And I know this sounds kind of stupid, but I need to explain it in really simple terms so it's clear what I'm trying to achieve. The setup in this round is some A player either playing retake or playing inside the side holding slope, an AWP holding palace, a CON player watching mid, and two B players. So the setup is again 2-1-2. Two, two. 
This is what I think people fail at the absolute most in all pucks and also matches that are not pro matches. I have a theory that unless you smoke B-Split or smoke Top Gun, you have not changed the CT setup whatsoever. This everything you've done in mid is somewhat useless. Because we again have, just like we had before the window smoke, where we had two rifles playing A, now we actually, in fact, by doing the window smoke, has a, an even heavier setup on the sides. We have an AWP and a rifle playing A. So, the reason why I think the B-Split smoke and the Top Gun smoke is so important is this. If I smoke B-Split now, and the con player is the only one playing mid with this smoke, how is he going to block this? Now, all he can say is... Guys, they can split B. And in the moment that the T's can split B, he has a decision to make. Does he stay in con and spam the smoke and hope? Or does he rotate over to B? Or does he ask his AWP to rotate over to B? It realistically doesn't matter if it's the con player or the AWP player who rotates. But this time, we have done something to force a reaction that changes the CT setup. Does it make sense what I'm saying now? Yeah. So, yeah. by using this B-Split smoke and the window smoke, by just using this singular smoke, this is in fact the first time we have done anything important in mid to change the CT setup. Now, this B-Split smoke is showing that we want to go B. And so one guy from either A or mid is going to rotate B. And instead the setup will be either 3B to A. Or the setup will be something kind of weird like 3-1-1. Where we have three guys B. We have one guy playing around like window jungle area. And we have one guy playing alone on A. Either playing inside side or playing retail. By doing this one smoke. Now is the first time we've changed the CT setup, and now is the first time we have actually pressured the CT setup, okay? And it's the same. We do the same exercise with the top con smoke. Boom. Top con smoke. What happens? Well, the con player has a decision to make. Does he want to play inside connector? Which can be kind of nasty, <clears throat> because uh, even with this smoke, one good flash here will just absolutely demolish him if he's sitting like this. And if he's sitting like this holding holding heal, I mean, you have to flash a little bit differently, but if you if you flash like this, this flash should be taking this guy crouching and holding this. And so for him, this top con smoke, he either has to play inside con and be kind of um, helpless and uncomfortable or he has to give it up. Now, if he plays, like, if he decides to give it up, he kind of has another decision to make. Does he play stairs side, or does he play jungle side? Because if he plays jungle side, now the T's can go stairs, and they can potentially kill his teammate playing inside the side. If he plays uh, stairs side, well, now someone can lurk into jungle. And the possibility for him to play in the middle doesn't really exist. So, going with the same theory... If this top gun smoke comes, well, now the AWP is likely not going to want to play in jungle. So the AWP will now rotate ticket, for example, and the rifle player on like the, the guy who was holding mid before has to kind of completely forfeit mid control and has to play somewhere, for example, jungle area where he's able to hold the window boost and the top gun smoke. But this now allows us to go and hit a weak bomb site on B. And essentially these smokes are the same. One is making it possible for us to go B. And the other is also making it possible for us to go B. One is making it possible for us to go up con without short spotting us. And the other one is kind of also allowing us to go up con and run bench without short seeing us. So... This is just what I'm sort of trying to get across. If you don't do either of these smokes, you don't put any pressure on the CTs. 
And it obviously it can be um, there are many different lineups for for top con smoke. It can be thrown, you know, from here. It can be thrown from behind the boxes. It can be thrown like this. It can be thrown from down and underground like this. But this is why you see so many professional teams play with top con smoke. If you don't use any of these smokes, the CTs are basically going to always play heavy on the sides. And that kind of puts us into the next part of the conversation. I mentioned earlier how I think you can kind of understand uh, Mirage as a either the CTs are heavy on A or they are heavy on mid. We talked about it already. If the orb gets smoked, he goes here. Now you have two guys playing A. And because of this, uh, it's impossible for you to contact out on A. If you want to contact out Palace, you die. And if you want to contact out Slope, well, it's pretty difficult because this guy is probably sitting in some kind of weird off angle and it's very easy for him to just get like flashes in the back if he's playing default, flashes in the back if he's playing shadow, if he's playing CT, people can flash uh, over bench. Uh, as long as the CTs are playing heavy on the sides, it's really, really difficult to, to play. And that is also why if you've ever uh, had a situation where... Oh, let me start a little bit differently. I had a I had a coaching session, like an individual coaching session with a guy, and he said, I don't really like playing inside of Palace because I never understand when is the right time to go. Well, it seems kind of counterintuitive in a way, but the right time to go out of Palace is the time when the CTs are not playing heavy A. So if your teammates are going out mid, and they threw a window smoke from spawn. This is most likely the moment when the orb is jungle holding palace. Instead, you either want your teammates to go out mid and do this, like do maybe instead a top mid smoke and the window smoke later, or maybe they don't want to do anything at all on mid so that the CT orb stays here. Um, maybe they want to use window smoke. This is something I personally like a lot. You call for your team to throw the window smoke and I just say go out and just like take mid fast, like make a lot of noise mid. If you make a lot of noise mid, the orb will almost always come and play around come because he needs to block where there are the most people. And this is the moment when the CTs are not playing heavy on A. Um, in all of this, I've kind of neglected even talking about playing B. Not because playing B is bad, but simply because, in my opinion, everything that happens in mid is somewhat dependent on the AWP and the connector player. There are some matches you will play where the short player is playing really aggressive. These are matches where it would be really great for you to do a B-pop, because if you make the CCs play heavy mid, well, they are weak on the sides. But there will also be games where the short player will just be playing around B the entire time. And that's why what I'm kind of teaching you is understanding how the AWP behaves and understanding how the CON player behaves. I have a strategy that I would like to teach you guys, which is, uh, I can tell you, tried and, trust, uh, like tried and tested in many different teams. I've been using it since uh, 2018. And it is one of the simplest strats you can run on Raj. But it has many layers, and there's really a lot of thought that goes into it. It's a strat that is hard to call in a pog necessarily, uh, or like it can be, um, because uh, people have to have a pretty good understanding of the strategy itself. But I will show it anyway now, and we can discuss it a little bit. And maybe I'll give you guys some questions. So this is a tactic called Avangar, and it is uh, called Avangar because... It is basically completely stolen from Avangar, who later turned into uh, Virtus Pro. Yeah, so it's like the, the yeah, it's probably a, a mastermind move from Jane. Basically, the setup for the round is you go four A, two of them slope, and two palace. You have one mid, and the mid guy is actually the guy who has the by far hardest role. He's basically playing a lurk, but in a way an info lurk, and I will try to show you why. So all he really needs in mid is one of the A players needs to smoke top mid for him, and 
that's really it. The guy who's going mid will now use his flash to go out mid, come out behind boxes, and throw window smoke. When this window smoke comes, the mid player is now having only one job. He needs to call either heavy A or heavy mid. The difference is most of the time really obvious. Especially in pogs where, let's say, the orb, when he gets smoked, he will nade this window smoke, boom, he checks mid. Then the con player, he will come out here, he will instantly do this smoke and play somewhere here. Maybe even you see that the short player is coming out and he is doing this smoke, or he's coming out, he's flashing over window and he just wants to fight. In this moment, I think we can agree. The CTs are playing heavy mid. The setup for the CTs right now, 1-3-1, one, one, one on A, one con, one window, one short, and one on B. In this moment, the mid player from us, like the T-sided mid player, will be calling they are playing heavy mid. This means the A guy is playing solo, either retake, like we talked about earlier, or he is playing somewhere inside the site. And this is the moment when the two slow players and the two palace players, they simply contact out. They will be essentially having a four on one encounter here on the A bomb site. And by just walking out and taking this fight with two each place, it means that there's almost always a guarantee for a trade. Now, in the event that this guy is just jumping info on a ticket, well, it's probably a moment where we use the grenades that we talked about earlier, like doing the doing the deep jungle smoke and doing the top con smoke and getting like just random flashes over stairs and swinging uh, together with the team. In the event that they kill the A player, this is also a possibility. You can also, by the way, I forgot to mention this. If you go in here and you look for this part of the roof, if you're running through this Molotov, it lands in a way where the orb can never peek here. So this Molotov can also be really good. And in the event that let's say we kill the A player, we can do this Molotov, flash over stairs, and swing together and try to kill Khan. This was one of two things that can happen. In this case, the CTs are playing heavy mid. That's why we're contacting on the sides. There's the other possibility, which is the CTs are playing heavy A, or in other words, they are playing heavy on the sides. This will probably look something like this. Again, the T-sided player will get a top bit smoke. He will come out and he will do this window smoke for himself. And he doesn't hear anything. There's no con smoke. There's no flash or window. And at this moment, the mid player needs to be the one activating. He needs to now be taking the space by walking close and clearing his angles as far as he possibly can without getting contact. I like to stop right around here. Because what we discussed about earlier as well is that if the orb starts window, he plays behind the window smoke. He's now playing heavy on the sides. There is likely a connector player who is playing here info or the orb holding an angle like this. And that's why I like stopping here. In this case, the mid player will say, guys, I'm in position. You can start. And that is now when instead of going for a contact play, the slow players are going to do like a half-assed execute. So it could be either uh, up and down smokes. So this is up and down smokes. It's stairs and bench smoke. Up and down. Which blocks off the entire right side. Or another possibility could be to... Uh, yeah, this is actually another smoke I can teach you. You can get stuck in this corner. You can aim bottom. No, actually, I think it's top left of this. Jump throw. If I'm not mistaken. No, it's bottom, I guess. Hang on. Bottom left. Maybe they changed the VCs too, actually. I haven't used this one. No, that works. So this is... So bottom left is jungle smoke. And right after this, you can go over. You can aim like this for top con smoke 
You can also do, this is basically deep smokes. Um, the execute is not so important, but you can imagine what this does. When I, as the mid player, say I'm in position, now you're executing on A. Now I take my lurk, because when these smokes come in, the common reaction for the CTs will be try to flash all bench, try to use Molotovs on Palace, try to block as much as possible, maybe go through the smokes. And this is when there is a timing gap for me in mid to come and kill them in the back. And when I get this kill, I can simply tuck in and now the A players play. So kind of the last thing I have to say, just to even more make it easy to understand. Imagine an invisible rope between the CTs on A and the CTs playing mid. In the round that we just talked about where they are, the CTs are playing heavy mid, well, because all the CTs are currently pulled towards mid, that is when the A players need to play. But in the moment that the A players play, this is when this guy, the A player, is pulling the rope and pulling his teammates towards him. So in the moment the A players get contact, now is my moment to walk down mid. If the CTs are playing heavy mid, I let my A players play first. If the CTs are playing heavy A, well, there's space for me to take in mid. The rope is pulled all the way towards A right now. I get into position. My T-side teammates do an execute that makes it so the CTs get pulled even closer to A. And that is when I make sort of my move. I kill someone, I stay alive, and now I'm pulling with the invisible rope all the attention towards mid, which now allows my teammates to make their move. Mirage can kind of be understood as having this invisible rope between A and mid. And that's why, going back to the question I had from a former student, or although still still a student, I guess, but, but in my previous coaching session that I had with, with an individual, he asked, when is the timing for me to go out A house? And the timing to go out A house is when the CTs are focused on mid. Sometimes, in pugs, this can take one minute. If my teammates are going out into mid, and what they do every round is they just smoke window, and they just chill here behind the boxes. Or they just have some AWP go over here and hold this angle the whole round. The CTs are now focused on A. And me making a play out on A would be wrong. But in the moment that my, that my teammates do a B-split smoke or top con smoke or start fighting these areas. That is when it's my moment to strike. Because my teammates are pulling this invisible rope towards mid. The rope, the invisible rope here being their attention. They are pulling all their attention towards them. And that is when I am not being held and I am moving out palace. I hope this kind of made sense, guys. Um, I would love some opinions. Like, could you explain the mid player who waits for the... Uh, mm -hmm. to get the, the frags from behind? Mm -hmm. Like, I think the, the, the biggest danger for him is, like, the top player. Or if, if you, yep. like... How do you, like, you don't know if you want to peek the other players from behind, if the shot player maybe go, goes to their room and lurks down from window or, or just stay, stay short. So how do you know that you don't get killed the uh, right moment you, you go into connector? This is a great, this is a great question. Um, well, basically the, the one thing I would say is that, um, in a in a in a moment where I'm smoking window right as the as the mid player and I'm walking down here, I think this is not so dangerous, because if the orb is not playing mid and the connector player is not playing aggressive mid, it's just straight up wrong for the short player to be playing aggressive in mid. Yeah, yeah. I think the more dangerous point is like when it's you later. when you want to yeah you know, to make you want this to go into connector. Yeah, because if a a contacts like probably the the player play short will maybe look yeah out of shot well i think if you're standing here uh let's say i mean there's a few ways to deal with this it's it's a little bit on on skill i guess if i if if you imagine we did up down smokes that's probably my personal favorite on this avant tactic 
the con player will either be standing like this and molotoving and like trying to play around stairs where you can you can a lot of the time see him even from bottom con like see an arm you know or he yeah. will be somewhere here throwing flashes and being ready to swing through the bench move on a good timing you know and so it's quite likely that you're gonna get contact on the con guy um, from down here you know but mm -hmm. he will have a spec turn so that's like that's one way um I guess in the event that you have top con smoke, you need to worry about it even less because you can just clear this. Okay, he's not here, and now you can play headshot angle on short. But if it is really a big worry or something you've died to a lot, I guess a fix is just that when your teammates do these smokes and the A players now have uh, focus on A or like the CTs have focus on A, you can walk here, and if you don't see, you can even go and peek this. But I think what a lot of reactions will be is that. Um, I can say, imagine it from the CT point of view. There's top mid smoke. Then there comes window smoke. It really looks like you're many mid. And so the short player is probably not playing aggressive alone. If none of the others are playing aggressive. Then when you all of a sudden do like up down smokes on A. I think for a lot of short players what they will do is they will try to go out here fast. And if you're standing down here he won't be able to see you but you will be able to hear him you know. And if you can hear right. him coming, it will uh, like be pretty good duels for you if you're standing down here. You could even try something like just moving over here. And as the short player comes out here, he checks like this. He jumps. Like now you just kill him in air. And then maybe even just stay alive. Now the connector player who's playing behind these smokes, he has to be so afraid of you, you know, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, all right. I personally That's... haven't had an issue with it, but yeah, you could you could walk across if you don't see him and go up on a bench and take the fight or it's kind of just again it's a little bit on skill and that's why the mid player is he, he doesn't even have to be the IGL of the team like it doesn't have to be him that says that this round is good but it needs to be a kind of clever player playing in mid and he needs to be good at recognizing either heavy A or heavy mid and then he also is kind of the one setting up the entire round he, he needs to get into the right spot he needs to say it at the right time he needs to make his move at the right time um, it's very dependent on this mid player doing a good job because if he goes out here, for example, and gets Molotov behind boxes and he doesn't turn it off, he swings out, he dies to the orb. Now the CT is no mid is full clear. Well, the whole round has fallen apart because the CT say, oh, mid is clear. Okay, let's go play heavy sides. And then the current player will immediately do like a Molotov palace and yeah, the round falls apart. You have to reset okay. completely. So, But it's a, it's a good question. I understand why, why you ask it. I just personally haven't had this issue, but I... I think it's good that you ask these questions. It's also very common at the moment to play at that, uh, like, uh, um, how do you call it in English? Like uh, these stones in, in window, you know? As yeah, a here. Top player. Yeah, that's true. Like, and that's also why ideally you want it to look something like this: that you like smoke window, and then like you listen a little bit, you check after the window smoke. Okay, they're not here. I don't hear top con or like a bottom con smoke, so you will just walk down. If he wants to go ladder. You might kill him in headshot angle here, and otherwise you can get close oh, okay. now. Now cool. they execute, window smoke is still up, and now you take your timing, you know. Okay, so okay. Even if he's on bricks here, like he, he won't have any impact. Okay, sounds nice. Thank you. No problem, man. Any other uh, questions? Can I have a question? Oh. Yeah. Uh, you first shot. You, you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I wanted to ask a bit more about uh, the rope. So mm -hmm. uh, I think I get the main idea, mm -hmm. but if you could go a bit deeper on it and the timings, I'd, I'd love that. Um, I will try something. Uh, I don't know. I guess I wait. I'm gonna try something stupid, okay? Like uh, this might be the first time this has been done in a Gusso Academy. We're going to paint. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, my painting skills are awful. But imagine this is the rope, right? Um, I like to use a map like Dust Two uh, to explain it because Dust Two. If you look at the radar, I hope you guys have like a mental image. Every CT on the map is kind of on the same line most of the time. Like the B players and the mid player. And the short player and the guy playing on a side they're all in one straight line okay um 
But yeah, imagine basically that we have this guy. Uh, yeah, wait, I will do this real quick. Uh, I don't know if this is the best way to explain it, but this... I've been actually meaning to make a video like this. I'm just, my editing skills are not good enough. But let's just say this guy is called A because he's the A player. This guy is called Con. We're just on Mirage again, right? This guy is... Oh. This guy is short. This guy is B. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this the same as uh, red? red? Red, or is this different? As what? If you uh, red red roll roll. Uh, yeah, I've I guess. Heard that before. No, I haven't heard it like that. But I oh, call really? it the. Yeah. I call it. I mean, I think every team kind of does it, but I call it the the, the Danish Counter Strike chain. Basically, yeah. the way Danish people look at Counter Strike is with the CTs being a chain. So, yeah. um, in the event, for example, that I kill the con player right like right now right now we have this split we have a perfect split of balance on the map um you have like your a player your con player your all player your short player your b player and they're all playing like this uh, everything is perfect right now um if the con player dies the way a danish team will traditionally deal with this is that okay con player he is dead well that means that the all player now comes over and he fills up the space so the all player he won't go all the way to a but he will try to be somewhere in between uh yeah this would be so nice if i had photoshop because then i could actually instead of deleting things just move it but so now because the con player is dead the orb has to go and fill up his area and now because the all player is moving well then the short player also kind of has to move a little bit to get closer and you you want to end up with the same the same balance basically like you want the chain basically to to yeah kind of be the same the same way that like uh i guess it's even more important now like this is we are now four alive if the b player dies boom, 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 well, the short player now has to go and take over B, so he moves all the way over to the right side. I know this is pretty dodgy dr drawing. And that means that the orb now needs to move somewhere closer to the middle. So you have somewhat of a, a balance again. Does this kind of make sense, what I'm doing right now? Or is this just... Yeah, yeah. I'm a full waffling. Because um, this is like... Wait, let me uh, stream Counter-Strike again. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we will, I will try to get you guys on board with this and afterwards, uh, maybe do a couple of more questions. Um, in the event that the, the, let's say I as the A player play aggressive and I die, die down slope. Well, now the con player, at least the way I see it, will maybe Molotov Palace and he will move and try to get into the A side. So he's filling up the void left by the A player. And then the orb. Well, maybe come and play top con so he's able to help mid but he's also able to help a and then the short player he is i don't know maybe going a little bit more in a position where if they go up con now he's able to fight them as well and this kind of invisible rope or this like counter strike chain is how you have an effective ct side on a map like uh, mirage let me see if i can join spectate and look at the radar like, the chain looks like this. Let's just say the con player is here, right? Uh, yeah? Um, does that not, like, with that, with that, like, kind of theory, do you mm -hmm. not fundamentally mean that you're thinning control of multiple areas to do that, rather than strengthening control of one and then retaking after? Yes. It is what? basically... Well, it's, it's differences in uh, Counter-Strike theory, in a way, because... As I mentioned, this is kind of the Danish Counter Strike chain. Like you put yourself. Uh, uh, well, let me let me do it differently. I think this is actually a pretty good example that I've never used before. Um, is anyone here familiar with tennis? Like, I mean, you probably all know what tennis is, but does anyone know anything about tennis? I don't know what tennis is. Or badminton, or any of these like <laughs> sports on a court. 
Yeah. One of the first things that at least I think you get taught is that after you return like the ball to your opponent, you want to move towards the middle because that's the position where you're able to uh, like if your opponent shoots to the right, okay, you can reach it from the middle. If your opponent shoots to the left, you can reach it from the middle, right? It's like very fundamental for these kind of sports. And I guess the way Danish people look at Counter-Strike on CT, it's kind of the same. You you explain it as we're thinning out the control and um, I don't know if you, if it's it doesn't really matter if it's intentional or not, but it sounds very negative. You could look at it in a positive light and be like, this is a way we are putting ourselves in positions to be able to help each other always. Whereas a team exactly like Virtus Pro that I mentioned earlier is probably the type of team where, uh, ah, fuck, our A, a player died. Okay, well, then the short player, he will leave B and they will overstack A so that they gamble stack. Um, that's yeah, the so mo Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, so like uh, I kind of did see it in a negative way because using your tennis example, there's not two balls coming towards you at any one time. But in CS, there is two balls coming towards you if we're going to continue with that analogy, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you're holding multiple areas and you have less control of both, mm -hmm. does that just not mean you're more likely to die? Well, And then thus weaken that area of the map even further and then lose control of a, a critical area. I mean, I think this is, this is some really good and critical questions you are you are proposing i have a, a i think a solid counter argument like a, in your in your thought up uh, theory here right where what do we strengthen like our a player dies what do we strengthen it's just a question do we stack a uh, or probably, probably mid right you want to strengthen mid and then go for um info on a and then retake a but continue with the well, it depends where they die, right, as well. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, very, of course, of course. It's very dependent, but just in, in this, in the scenario that, let's say, a guy's playing CT and he dies, mm -hmm. um, you would want to strengthen mid mm -hmm. and then have B rotate over to mid as well and play, like, kind of 3-1. Um, and you can, you can quickly defend B, but then retake A as a 4 um, and catch any kind of, like, uh, catch any kind of, like, lurk or whatever and maybe even even the odds that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got like one guy from B rotating over and then they just send two guys out B, you've mm -hmm. just lost B and you've lost a player. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm kind of looking at it. I get that as well. But then I would counter that and say, okay, so every time that we lose an A player, you want to play a four and five retake? You think that's a good, that's a solid yeah, maybe not. solution? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, I mean, if time, so. no, but but in, in this thought up uh, theory of yours, and I, again, I don't, I hope I don't come across as being. Um, I think the discussion is great that you bring it up, but I want to also sort of give some some counter arguments to it. Um, yeah. The way Virtus Pro play on Inferno, for example, they're kind of famous for that. Is that even on buy rounds, they will just some rounds play. Obviously, this is not Inferno, but they will play four on A and play one on B. And you could ask yourself, isn't this bad as well? I mean, if you overstack an area, and as you mentioned, there are two balls coming at you, and you don't know if it's hitting A or B, isn't this bad? Because in the event they go B, this, su this fucking sucks. We lose every time. But in the event they go A, we have a good chance. Well, the, the more Danish or Scandinavian approach to Counter-Strike is one that is uh, in my opinion a more consistent style of counter-strike so to put some words on that is that um when you you play the kind of danish style of counter-strike uh for example on inferno right a team like virtus pro will happily gamble stack on ct but a danish team will probably be doing more repushes uh, they will do more retake utility, they will do more flash checks, they will play in a way where they avoid what I call playing in the dark, like playing without information. And it's just, one is not necessarily more correct than the other, they're just different theories. Um, it is why we rarely see um, Virtus Pro make deep runs in tournaments, at least this is my opinion of it. If you play a more Russian style of Counter-Strike, which in my eyes 
on T side means taking more risk and playing more on individuals and playing more on timings and and walking through smokes and stuff like this. If you have a day where the stars align, your opponents stand no chance. Like uh, a top 50 uh, HLTV Russian team could legitimately go to a major and beat the world's best team playing the style in the best of one. But it's just not consistent in the same way that a, that a more Scandinavian approach is. And that is why the majority of the top teams we see making deep runs right now have a Scandinavian in-game leader, or more specifically a Danish in-game leader. It's simply because if you find a, a, a st- like a brand of Counter-Strike that is more consistent, well, sure, you might not win every tournament and you might not win many matches 13-2. But you will just win. You will go for deep runs much more often. We see, like, throughout all of Counter Strike, almost all of the teams that have had an era have had a much more team play uh, approach to Counter Strike. If you go through them, NIP super team play. I would say Fnatic, the only outlier. They were very chaotic, um, very aggressive. You have your SK, very team play oriented. You have your Stralis. I don't think I need to put any words on that. And you have your Navi. And Navi is a CIS team, or at least was, (laughs) but they employed a very Scandinavian brand of Counter-Strike playing, for example, maps like Nuke, where they would, you know, play with one Lobby Lurk and having Electronic play almost a default down secret every round while Boomage was playing a default alone towards, like, uh, on the heaven garage area um, and then having two guys kind of setting up the play uh, as part of that um, what you mentioned it's not wrong and if you wish to play in that way you should definitely do it it is a way where you can essentially beat anyone and you can lose to anyone but the way I see it oh yeah sorry if if there's a question like, uh, no no so I just, so I just wanted to kind of get a bit of elaboration on the player who's rotating to almost two control points or like mm-hmm. um, a wider area of control is mm-hmm. that player then going to play um, a more info based play and fall back more often rather than take fights in order to just delay and wait for teammates rather than try and actually maintain the controller well i think that's kind of difficult for me to answer directly but let's just take this example that we had yeah. our our slow player pushes down and uh, he dies bang he's dead now our connector player what I would probably do as connector player in this moment is I would Molotov Palace to block a fast push. And then I would try, since my teammate died like around here, like a uh, boom boom, uh, I would try to move into the A side so I can fill up his position. Then, if I was the AWP player here, I would likely go and try to play this angle so that I am playing con and I'm playing mid. But I am able to, if they come palace, to just basically swivel, kill this guy. Or if they're going up ramp, I'm able to flash my teammate in the back. Um, If they, I don't know, smoke uh, B-split, maybe I'm able to take a shot. Uh, If my short player needs help, I'm able to go stairs and flash over window. Um, I'm in a position where I'm able to help my A guy. I'm still able to play mid. And the same if I'm the short player, in this moment, maybe I go out and hold this angle, which is like kind of an off angle. So if my AWP gets contact on a guy here, now I'm stepping out. I'm trying to kill this guy who's running across. And at the same time, I'm maybe still able to use my Molotov for B house if I hear steps here and my B player stays B. Now we've sort of come up with a solution where on the fly we can defend B, short slash mid. Con slash mid and A with four guys. And all of these people are connected somewhat. Like the A player is playing with the con guy. The short player is playing with the B guy. But the short player is also somewhat connected to the to the con player. And with this, we sort of make a chain. Um, I don't think just because someone dies you necessarily have to play aggressive always or play passive always but it's more so that the, the danish brand of counter-strike is that um when you lose an entry for example it doesn't mean the end of the world uh, it just means we're man down 
can I uh, can I come with an input slash question? It's just yeah. like my thinking of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think this like really depends on like the main advantage because if you are too alive and uh, they are poor left, I don't think you would play like this. No. Like then you would probably stack. Yeah. So I think it's like maybe the misunderstanding or something mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, life life penguin is asking about. And then the other thing is, if you're like free left, maybe then you play a bit more like information based instead of like taking duels. So you're yeah. probably going for the retake at least. Mm -hmm. Again, depending on the main advantage, because if you're free against five, then you will probably need to like kill one even to have a chance. Mm -hmm. Or then if you like that fails or something, then you need to save. And then, uh, yeah, I always use the NATO's law, <laughs> NATO's Apex law, the golden law. We can drop two and two cannot drop. Yeah, uh, the golden yeah. rule, yeah, of Counter Strike. Yeah, the golden rule. Yeah, yeah we call it the NATO rule. Okay. In uh, every good. team I played. Yeah. <laughs> that's we played this year. Yeah, okay, that's sick, man. Like, like, also, if you wanted to retake like four versus five, you needed way more utility yeah. left on, on, on CT side. So you would, from the beginning of the round, play with like way less utility to have a chance on that retake, I think. So it also depends on yeah how you played the, the round until then. Again, mm -hmm. I feel like this strategy, uh, like it will work, like pretty much always, if you are, like around uh, the same uh, amount of people alive as the enemy team. So if you're like one down, uh, from the enemy team, like if they are four and you're three, or they are three and you're two, I think that this will probably maybe in general work, but like, yeah. Not probably with mm -hmm. three and two, but yeah, in general, yeah, sure, like just one time. I think also to help you understand it a little bit better is that the chain doesn't have to necessarily be spread thin. It could also, in this case, uh, this is a little bit of a bad example, maybe, but it could be something like, uh, and this would be the last thing I say, uh, guys. Uh, then I think I'll head out because <laughs> we've actually already been talking for a long time. Um, but in the event that my slow player dies, right? You could have the con player move to A like we talked about, but you could, for example, have the AWP rotate to B, which would be a little bit of a crazy play. But like the A player could play retake, the orb could rotate on B. He could look into B like this while the other B rifle is pushing B for info, and the short player could go and switch with the orb. Then there's somewhat still balance. You're not stacking heavy on a side. Like it could also be. Let's say our AWP player died in mid and we feel like we have to do something. Maybe the con player goes to the other A player and they now double contact down slope. Well, if you imagine the chain now looks like this instead. Uh, this is also somewhat balanced because the two B players are playing pretty close to each other and the two uh, A players are playing pretty close to each other. So the kind of balance in a way of the chain is still around the middle and i mean i just want to leave you with this thought because the chain you can think of it in 2d and i think maybe you've never thought about this uh, neckline but yeah i i think the chain in at least 3d so imagine yeah. uh oh shit that's an alarm i've set for myself for some work i need to do um imagine a situation where our A player is playing aggressive and our con player is playing uh, not so aggressive and our window yeah. player is playing not so aggressive and our short player is playing not so aggressive. Well, for the chain to be around the middle, we cannot have our B player be here because that would put the middle of the chain somewhere like this. It's, it's not in balance. So... Instead, if we have our slow player playing aggressive, well, that requires our B player to be playing passive for the Actually, chain yeah, to be balanced. About this. I had a coach who uh, was always yelling at us. <laughs> okay. We did this wrong. Uh, uh, so I think this is actually one of our main focus points. Yeah, okay. The, but this is, this is a, super, with a, a super good thing to think as well, because like a really easy rule of thumb in Counter Strike is that if your one bomb side is playing aggressive, the other bomb side needs to play yeah. passive. Because he it, always. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just to keep. Uh, yeah, just just because it, it basically getting info on both sides of the map at the same time won't help you. No, if you then, you yeah. will run into them one place. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, exactly. 
He always called it like uh, pulling the tr uh, pulling the chain. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah, but that's uh, that's something we could maybe move into in a future uh, like a session. I could also be going through the chain on a map like Nuke, which is really for a lot of people the chain is difficult to understand because there is even a, a lower part on the map and stuff like this. Um, but that's something that could be of interest. We could definitely discuss it.